President Freiberger was one of the first people, not presidents, one of the first people to support Concordia when it was just two 23-year-olds with nothing but an idea and, um, and, and a PowerPoint. And so Matt and I will be forever grateful to you, uh, Madam President, and to, to Imants um, for all your support. So, so thank you for being here. Um, uh, Vira Vika Freiberger was president of Latvia from 1999 to 2007, and um, also has a long and distinguished academic career in the, in the field of psychology. Uh, and so one of the most fascinating uh, aspects uh, is that I think you must be one of the few president psychologists. Um, and, and, and so I wanted to, to start out by asking you about a topic that's been on everyone's mind lately, um, which is uh, the situation um, in Ukraine and, and with President Putin, who you know very well. And as a psychologist, how would you assess President Putin's motives? <laughs> and as a president, how would you assess his motives and, and uh, the future there? Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, I must say that the many years I had of experience uh, a brief period as a psychologist doing diagnostics, and which was a useful uh, phase in my career. Uh, but then uh, being uh, a professor of experimental psychology and a sort of talent scout for young people who had potential for going through their doctorate and becoming researchers later on, um, I pride myself on uh, on having an eye for talent and, and for brightness. And when I met these two young men, uh, I knew immediately uh, that there was gold in them, their hills, and that someday they would amount to something. That was quite clear. And I'm very proud of my diagnostic abilities <laughs> and my, my predictive abilities. Congratulations <laughs> on the five years of Concordia. Um, the world uh, uh, has its ups and downs. And uh, a lot of it has to do uh, with the people who are in leadership positions. Russia um, appointed a leader in a very surprising manner. I remember the Millennium uh, New Year's Eve, uh, well, what most people considered in 1999, December 31, turned into January 1st, 2000. Uh, there was a lot of excitement across the world just because of the way the figures are written. And on that night, uh, President Yeltsin of the Russian Federation uh, made his New Year's speech. And in that speech, he made a surprise announcement uh, that he was uh, appointing as uh, his successor uh, a prime minister who had been in office for a very brief period of months uh, after some uh, year, at least, of uh, President Yeltsin changing prime ministers like he was changing shirts or glasses. And um, vodka glasses, that is. Uh, and uh, it was a big surprise to a lot of people because he was one of many uh, former prime ministers. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, he had uh, a lot of uh, difficulties. The Kursk, uh, the Kursk uh, submarine sank with 150 sailors on board. They refused help from the Norwegians and from a British who had facilities for possibly saving those lives. Uh, he did not want to reveal the secrets of his atomic submarines and, uh, and sacrifice the lives of those sailors. There was a moment of uh, various other incidents happened that did not make him the most <laughs> man in Russia, but very steadily, uh, he put in place what, uh, what the Russians call the Siloviki, the, uh, the sort of gang of uh, supporters that he had already worked with in St. Petersburg. And uh, uh, his former uh, buddies from the KGB, uh, people he trusted, uh, people whom he uh, had selected uh, by a sort of survival of the fittest process, which goes on to this day, by the way, uh, and you either survive uh, along a leader like that, uh, or you, you get into serious <laughs> trouble, or you may you lose your life like uh, Nemtsov, or you uh, may wind up uh, spending a considerable part of your life in prison like Khodorkovsky. Uh, so um, 
getting Mr. Putin as an enemy is, uh, is no trivial matter. And people in Russia have come to realize that. He's built up what they call a vertical of power. And uh, as a Dodge uh, journalist uh, mentioned yesterday at a conference in Washington uh, on the Center for uh, European Policy Studies, uh, he said, why is he popular? Uh, well, it's like in Soviet times, when you have one brand of sausage, uh, you eat that brand of sausage. Uh, <laughs> there's no alternative. And so you say, yeah, he's our president, and he's just fine, he's doing fine, and, and he cares about Russia's greatness. And that, that has been uh, a motif that the communists <laughs> share about the greatness of Russia as a birthplace of communism, uh, as a, a sort of uh, heron folk, as then Hitler tried to make of the Germans, a master race, uh, because they were the cradle of the uh, October Revolution. And they were going to spread it in a messianic way to, to the rest of the world. We hear a lot of messianic talk now coming from Mr. Putin. So in some way you could say he's using this messianic talk about the unique mission of the, of the Russian people. Which, of course, is not that unlike uh, the sentiment of Americans uh, that they have a unique mission, that they are, uh, if you like, a bastion of democracy, uh, and of, uh, of free enterprise uh, and individual rights and so on and so forth. Uh, the Russians have their own myth, if you like, of the nation uh, and of the place of the individual uh, in it, which is rather smaller uh, in Russia uh, than it is here in America. Uh, but the idea of greatness of the nation uh, is, uh, in a way, it's common to both. The French certainly know about grandeur, you know, and the greatness of France, and they admire the grandeur of uh, Russia as well. And, uh, and the Brits, as a former colonial empire, also have sneaking uh, sort of sympathies with anybody who builds up a strong empire, even though with, with America they've had this, uh, well, I guess this sibling kind of relationship where a bit special allies and so on, but at the same time a certain tension and remembrance of the revolution after all. Um, uh, Mr. Putin today is flexing his muscles. Uh, he's pushing the limits. In many ways, he's like a two-year-old child uh, who, um, has, uh, who throws temper tantrums uh, if he doesn't get his way uh, and, uh, and screams until he gets what he wants. Uh, one place where he can scream is the uh, Security Council the permanent seat that Russia has allows them to give a veto to anything they simply don't like. This very obsolete, outdated uh, Second World War relic uh, is with us and will remain us for the unforeseeable future. And it's an absolute break on the efficiency of the United Nations in solving world problems. Uh, Mr. Putin is using his power and pushing the limits as much as he can. I personally think that he suffers from mania of grandeur, uh, and uh, he's certainly playing on the mania of persecution of his people. Whether his own is real or feigned, I am not at all sure. I think he, uh, by, by force of making his people paranoid, uh, I suspect that he is himself, he comes to believe that he is being threatened, but basically he threatens everybody, he bullies everybody, and he intimidates everybody. And anybody who tries to um, sort of get along with him by giving in to him and being nice has lost the game in advance. So Dr. Freiberger's prognosis for President Putin is <laughs> delusions of grandeur and so on and so forth. And you know, one thing that strikes me every time I've been lucky enough to visit Latvia a few times and Poland and Eastern Europe is that the people of Eastern Europe do not take their freedom for granted because it's so new. Um, forgive the, the simplistic question. Um, is there a real fear? Do you really fear, as a Latvian, do you fear Russia in a real way? Or is it just talk? Their actions in Georgia uh, showed that they could do uh, what was unthinkable. I myself had written an article for the French <laughs> embassy uh, saying, 
Mercifully, the days are long past when here in our European continent uh, we have to worry about tanks rolling across our borders as they did in Latvia in, in 1940. Um, uh, these days are long past us and then uh, the next week uh, Russian tanks roll into Georgia. And what happens, the world sort of looks by and says, oh gee, that's too bad, you know, it's not, not very nice. Uh, and that's the end of it. And they're still there today in, in Abkhazia and uh, South Ossetia. So that having gone so well, uh, when he, uh, I was asked on Latvian television, we sort of hear strange rumors that uh, Russia is about to annex Crimea. Can you imagine such a thing that, that Russia would, would march into Crimea and annex it? And I said, well, frankly, it would be my worst nightmare, but uh, yes, uh, I, by, by then, you see, I, I said, I can imagine it. I, I think it's a, it would be a sad thing, but yes, they are quite capable of doing it. The Russian ambassador then came out with a, uh, a posting on his, uh, on his uh, webpage uh, saying that former presidents, like athletes at the Sochi Olympics, should not open their mouth before taking a drug test. And two days later, tanks rolled into um, and little green men crawled into Crimea. Mind you, it was not an, uh, an open uh, and honest attack uh, on a neighboring country. It was a sneaky one, but it was an attack nonetheless. Do you think Crimea will ever be Ukrainian again for the foreseeable future? Theoretically, it's possible. What the likelihood is, uh, they will, they, the Russians will work on, on integrating into Russia as much as they can. They've done that in the past. Uh, we must remember that Crimea was Tatar, as a matter of fact, neither Russian nor Ukrainian. And Stalin deported the whole Tatar population en masse, uh, somewhere off in the vast reaches of Siberia, uh, and, um, and then Russified the region. Well, and much of what President Putin is doing, you see, uh, is not his own invention. He seems to be following through uh, on, uh, on plans laid down way back in the Soviet system. Uh, as Stalin was uh, successfully expanding uh, what became the Soviet Union, um, they planted these seeds of discontent in all surrounding countries, or as many as they could. And of course, ethnically being mixed, these, these border regions were uh, quite, uh, uh, if you like, uh, fertile ground uh, for that, uh, that sort of action. Transnistria uh, was purposefully industrialized and purposefully Russified. Uh, South Ossetia and, uh, and Abkhazia have different ethnic populations and their sense of uh, difference was cultivated and uh, encouraged uh, from the Russian side, and so on and so forth. Nagorno-Karabakh, the enclave, was actually fought uh, by uh, supposedly Armenian troops who really were uh, Russian troops who took it away from, uh, from uh, Afghanistan, from, uh, from uh, Azerbaijan, uh, with the purpose of creating an enclave and creating a frozen conflict, and so on and so forth. So that in that sense, uh, there's a continuation of what we had before. The only way Crimea will really uh, become Ukrainian again is if Ukraine makes a success of itself to such an extent that Crimeans in a true referendum without foreign troops being there, uh, present, intimidating them, in a true and free referendum, seeing the success that Ukraine has made of itself, would say, yeah, well, we'd rather be with them. But that will be their choice. I think by, by now it's clear uh, that uh, it's, it's sort of Touch and go. Just to switch gears a little bit, um, I don't know the exact figure, so forgive me, but uh, there aren't enough women leaders in the world, and, and you, were, uh, you were one of them for eight years as, as president. And, and we've spoken before about um, how when you went to different summits, uh, there were times where you were the only woman or one of, one of two women or one of three women. And I wonder if you could just give us some thoughts on... on um, how being a woman sort of uh, impacted your presidency, how it helped, how, you know, uh, and what we can do to, to encourage more women leaders around the world. I've been busy, uh, I think, uh, ever since I was elected, encouraging women uh, not uh, to be brainwashed into thinking that they are somehow a different species of, of, uh, of being, human being, uh, a subspecies, if you like, that's not cut out of the same cloth 
uh, and does not have leadership qualities. Uh, little girls start being brainwashed uh, about it when they're quite young. Uh, young girls in their teens uh, get told that if they want to be feminine, sexually attractive, and get a good husband and, be, and have a lucky love life and have children, uh, then they better not uh, be too butchy and too masculine and too especially not too assertive. My heavens. Any woman who is assertive is a bitch. Uh, <laughs> any man who is assertive is a man. Uh, uh, he has leadership qualities. Uh, a woman who asserts herself uh, is coming on too strong. Uh, she has to calibrate how she comes on and so on. Well, see, I decided that I wanted none of that. Uh, ever since I was a little girl, when I read fairy tales, I loved fairy tales. Well, I love to read anything that I can get my hands on. And uh, when I read fairy tales, I didn't identify with the princess lying uh, on top of a glass mountain, uh, asleep in a, in a glass coffin. I thought that's a very boring role to play. Uh, and I'd rather be the prince who's riding up uh, the mountain, the first, you know, on a copper horse, and then a silver horse, and then a golden horse. I obviously identified with the active person in the folktale. And uh, psychoanalysts of the Jungian school will have confirmed that this is actually how it's meant to be. Uh, the characters in fairy tales represent different aspects of the personality. And uh, uh, luckily, as a child, I spontaneously had this ability uh, to, uh, to identify with different characters. I remember reading about the last independent Latvian king uh, in the 13th century uh, who lost the battle with the Crusaders and took 100,000 Zemgallians into exile into Lithuania and disappeared forever. Uh, and I cried for a week and I thought, if I had been king, I would have found a way to somehow save the country. So, and I was 10 years old, so I, I really did not, uh, and I, it, I, thinking about it, I thought you'd ask me this question. And you know what possibly helped me? I had um, rootless growing up as a child, because I left home at six as a refugee child. I was trundled from one place to another. Uh, from Germany to Morocco to Canada. Uh, always a different milieu, always changing where we live, uh, never having the same friend for very long. But I also never was around long enough to be brainwashed into stereotypes that would hold me back. On the other hand, I was able, I must say, it takes a certain amount of initiative. I always try to make the best of all the situations <laughs> where I was. And so that I, I try to grab the, uh, the assertiveness, if you like, and I never allowed myself to be intimidated about being assertive. I, when I was young and I was a, a student uh, at university, uh, it didn't seem an issue. I became president of the French club quite naturally because I spoke the best French uh, among those present. It seemed with no fuss about it, you see. Uh, meritocracy is what I, what I was after, and I think girls should, should be thinking like that. In Canada, we had a program about when I was vice president of the Science Council of Canada about why girls don't go into uh, sciences and engineering. They get discouraged. Very often they get discouraged and so it's not, it's not a girlish thing to do. Increasingly now, of course, they do. They go into medicine. They, are, uh, they train as astronauts and we have to encourage girls. Please, don't tell your girls or your daughters or your wives uh, that they can only be feminine by being meek, weak, uh, confused uh, and helpless because they're a burden on the men in their lives if they are uh, whereas they are helpmates uh, if they stand on their own feet. So it's in the interest of men as well as women to have strong women around as well as strong men. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the European crisis. Uh, the Greek crisis has uh, re-emerged over the past couple of months and maybe is, is, is uh, now uh, sold for a bit. Perhaps it'll come back. I think you overlapped with Chancellor Merkel for two years. Um, can we get a diagnosis? A strong woman, a real strong woman. Uh, when she started out in the CDU, uh, as uh, Chancellor calls protégé, he uh, also had an eye for talent and uh, 
and he singled her out um, as a protege, as a very young woman. She, um, of course, learned at the, uh, at the master's side, uh, but when she started rising up through the party ranks, I met her in Washington uh, at, uh, before she was actually ele elected, uh, just before she was elected head of her party, just, just about that time. And, uh, and she was dressed in gray, and I noticed that she was always wearing either dark blue or black or gray. And her colleagues and her um, competitors would call her the mouse, the mouse, uh, or the smetchen, the girl, because she'd been called girl. But look at uh, Chancellor Merkel today. She's wearing bright pink, bright green, uh, black pants, uh, the uniform that, for instance, Mary Robinson wears, uh, black slacks, uh, and a colorful jacket. When I, when I showed up in, uh, I think, the Sarajevo conference, with about 60 heads of state and government, all in dark blue or black, uh, I was wearing bright red, and I was very pleased to see floating along uh, President uh, Clinton, uh, this, uh, this uh, tiny little woman uh, in a bright canary uh, suit, and uh, with a huge pin uh, on, uh, on her side. Guess who it was? It was Madeleine Albright, with whom we had a session um, uh, the yesterday, the day before. Um, and I saw that Madeleine was not scared of her, um, you know, sort of saying, allowing herself that women can wear colors, or men, that's their business. If they all want to look drab, go ahead. Uh, women, uh, uh, there was a time when they, they were wearing lace, and, and the King of France had to issue, issue an ed edict that said, uh, more than two kilograms of lace are against the law. For men, for men. So, um, uh, you know, there was in the 60s, uh, a pink, pink shirt showed up or something like that, but men have a long way to go to, to liberate themselves from, uh, the, uh, from the strictures uh, of, the, of a drab, mousy color code, I'm sorry to say. Uh, women have liberated themselves, and Chancellor Merkel is not just a very, really, I think, a splendid leader, uh, but also a splendid woman. We have time for one more question, and um, I wonder how you and, and through your uh, uh, interactions with other um, leaders around the world view the current U.S. presidential election and uh, what you make of it, uh, if anything. I view it with alarm <laughs> and a touch of anxiety except that I was reassured by somebody knowledgeable of the American political scene uh, that it's still early days uh, in the electoral race and that uh, a lot of characters come out of the woodwork uh, in order uh, to get their 10 minutes of fame uh, or, or, or their um, you know, certain period of uh, attention in the media. Uh, they do get it uh, as candidates, and I hope that some of them are, are not truly and seriously uh, contenders for the role of leaders uh, of the United States of America, because the rest of the world, uh, we are concerned that America should be in good hands, uh, and that the American people should make a wise choice in choosing their leader. Well, uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I hope you all, and I assume you all now agree with me, um, that you are uh, a truly unique and uh, sort of transformational leader, and, and I, for one, am, am honored to, to know you, and, and thank you so much for your support over the, the years. It really, really means a lot to Matt and myself, so thank you so much. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, you all. Thank you.